Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Briz Science for November 2016. Uh, proudly presented by the University of Queensland and supported by our wonderful venue partners here at The Edge at the State Library of Queensland. I'm your MC for this evening, Joel Gilmore. Tonight, we are celebrating the evolving and ever increasingly important field of veterinary science. And it's pretty easy when you think about the increasing role that animals play in our society, whether it's the beloved household pet through to the challenge of meeting both climate change but also growing demand for meat and dairy products, that the need for cutting edge research in veterinary science is critically important. And we will get to lots more of that very shortly. Um, but there's also another reason for tonight's talk, and that's that this year, the School of Veterinary Science at the University of Queensland is celebrating 80 years since its first intake of students back in 1936. So it's now one of the largest veterinary schools in the Southern Hemisphere across both teaching and research. Um, and I think some of you have some flies on your seat with some more information, and there is um, a table set up outside if you'd like to know more. Um, so to that end, tonight we are privileged to hear from four veterinary experts from UQ's School of Veterinary Science who will give us some insights into the latest technologies and treatments that they encounter as veterinary researchers, clinicians and scientists. Afterwards, we'll be taking some questions here on the stage. Um, you would have received a piece of paper on your way in that you can write down your questions on. Um, we'll come around and collect those at the end of the presentations. And I will ask through as many of those as I can at the end of the talk. You can also ask your questions on Twitter, hashtag BrizScience. And uh, we'll be tweeting uh, throughout the talk. Um, and, of course, a video of these t this talk and all previous Briz Science talks will be available on our website, brizscience.org. So go and check those out, particularly if you're a newcomer to Briz Science. Um, finally, I'd love to invite you to food and drink out in the foyer. And um, we'll have a chance to chat to our presenters as well as some other UQ staff from the school there. Okay. Uh, and I can just ask you to turn your phones to silent now. Um, but feel free to keep tweeting. So we're going to start tonight with one of the veterans of veterinary science at UQ, uh, Dr. Bob Donnelly. Bob has had a career in private practice in Queensland and the UK and now heads up the Avian and Exotic Pets Service at the UQ Vets Small Animal Hospital. With over 30 years experience, Dr. Bob is one of the best placed experts to tell us about the evolution of bird and exotic animal medicine and about the variety of animals that ends up on his doorstep every day. Could you please welcome to the stage, Dr. Bob. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. It was pretty hard to come back after an introduction like that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm, I'm what they call a clinical academic in that I started at the University of Queensland six years ago as a, um, a clinician working down in the new small animal hospital at Gatton. And since then I've evolved into an associate professor, I'm not sure how. Um, I think if you survive long enough. Um, but anyway, I'm now working and running in the avian and exotic pet service, um, which my nurse always laughs about when I use that phrase because, as she says, well, you are the service. And I said, well, you are too. So there's Beck and I, um, and we run the, the Avian Exotic Pet Service. So I'm not going to be talking too much about exotic animals tonight. I'm going to be talking more about wildlife um, because we see a tremendous amount of wildlife coming through. Where we are at the university, at, uh, we're at Gatton. So we're halfway between Brisbane and Toowoomba. I live in Toowoomba. Um, so it's only a 40-minute run down the hill to get to work. Um, seems like 80 minutes coming home. But um, it's a brand-new facility um, as in it was opened in 2010, and we've already started to outgrow it. The, the practice has become so busy, not just the Avian Exotic Pet Service, but my colleagues from the Small Animal Service are going to be talking about medicine and surgery that they do there, and um, I just cheat off them, because they're really, really smart. So because of where we are, we see a tremendous amount of wildlife. Um, we have a wide range of species that come in. We get little cuties, like little feather-tailed gliders. We get a lot of these guys coming through. They're usually just found in the foliage of gum trees that have come down, and um, people often think they're mice, and they come in and they're tiny little things. And we get a lot of skippies. We get these joeys coming in um, of all, all ages and sizes, 
And sadly, we often get um, adult kangaroos and adult wallabies that have been hit by cars. And we usually, unfortunately, have to euthanise those because of the severity of their injuries. But we always check their pouches and we find these little babies and um, we can patch them up and pass them on to a carer. So we see the furries. We get monotremes. I know there's platypus in the Gatton Creek because I've seen them, but we haven't had any present, even though the creek is nearly dry at the moment. But we get a lot of echidnas coming through. We see a couple every month coming through. Usually they've been hit by a car, which isn't too bad. They seem to survive that most of the time. Um, often they come in hit by dog, which is not so good. Um, you wouldn't think a dog would take on something like that, but they do, and they can do a fair, about, fair amount of damage. We get a lot of birds coming in, like fry birds, um, kookaburras. Hang on, I pressed the wrong button. We get these fry birds that come in. Um, horrible things to work with because their nails are so sharp. They're a honey eater, so they're hanging on to the very end of the branches and they dig in and uh, you really know what pain is. Now, at this time of the year, we're getting these guys coming in, the channel billed cuckoos. These guys are actually a New Guinea bird and they migrate down the eastern coast of Australia during um, spring and summer and they parasitise the nests of currawongs and crows and birds like that, lay their eggs, they're a true cuckoo, they lay their eggs in the nests of those birds um, and then the chicks hatch out, boot out the currawong or crow chicks and the parents go on to rear these little things, not quite so little. Um, you'll see these flying around the, the, um, at night, or not at night, but during the day, flying along with a very distinctive lumbering sort of call. Kookaburras, we see a stack of kookaburras. Um, we get a lot of those, those guys coming through. Um, we also see a range of different parrots that are coming through. And we also see these guys, which I really enjoy. Um, after uh, treating birds, my favourite is treating uh, reptiles. So we get bearded dragons coming in hit by dog, hit by car, coastal pythons, carpet pythons, absolutely magnificent animals to work with. Um, and I really enjoy working with these guys. And it's usually somebody who wants to keep it as a pet. And we say, no, no, you can't, that's against the law. But we can look after it for you. So we see a fair few of those. Um, lots of turtles, always getting hit by car. So they come in for turtle shell repairs. And we get these guys, venomous reptiles coming in. This, Gary Fitzgerald's my senior nurse. This really makes his and my day because nothing focuses your attention more than having something in the room that can kill you. So we simply say, nobody else is allowed in the room. This is our fun time. And we'll spend half an hour just getting one of these guys restrained. So it's a, um, it's a very delicate procedure, but Gary and I both love working on these guys. Unfortunately, the most common presentation we get is shovel injuries, where people have tried to take them on with a shovel. And I've had them actually come in with their spine severed, but still survive. So they're, they're an amazing animal to work with. Just don't work too close. So what's wrong with them? Well, Bandicoot came in, hit by a car. That big lump, there's two joeys in there. Um, fully furred, mum was dead, but the joeys were still alive. We were able to rescue the joeys and pass them on to a carer, and they were released a couple of months ago. So we see a lot of those guys coming in. Not so much Bandicoots, we see a few. Um, enough that the students say, what's that when they see it? Um, kangaroo jays, all the time. Uh, we'd probably see somewhere between five and ten of these a week. Um, people are bringing them in, um, ranging things from just diarrhoea through to cataracts. Sometimes we'll have broken legs. Depends on what the original um, presentation, presenting reason was. Koalas, we see a fair few of koalas at the moment. In fact, I know the, the other zoos and um, wildlife hospitals that are treating koalas are all reporting a huge surge in the number of koalas that they're seeing. And we're seeing where we are, one a week at the moment. We are typically patching them up and then passing them down to Claude Lacasse at um, the Wacol RSPCA, um, where she's got eight years' experience dealing with koalas. So we patch them up, get them stable, and send them down for her for further evaluation. This is a, a koala with chlamydia. You've got a horrible conjunctivitis and a bit of stomatitis. Um, so we see those guys coming in, but most of the koalas we see have been hit by a car or, uh, sadly, we see a couple that have been um, treed by dogs and then come down from the tree and attacked. Um, turtles. This is a turtle that a dog got to. Not a big fan of dogs, guys, I'm sorry. But there's, you know, they kill my patients. Okay, but you can see he's been all chewed. He actually did very well, this guy. He's an eastern long neck. 
Um, we just put him on antibiotics for a couple of months and he, he was eventually released. Nothing happens in a hurry with reptiles. You're treating turtle injuries with these guys for two years. We get lots of these little guys, little tawny frog mouth. That's not a cataract, that's just a baby's eye. Um, there's a lot of tree felling going on in the Lockyer Valley. Um, Nexus is doing their um, range bypass. They're out there with teams of spotters looking for these guys. Um, but we see lots of other farmers and so forth. And with some of the storms we've had lately, um, we've had lots of little um, fledglings that have come in. Particularly this time of the year, we get a couple of day coming in that people have found and they think that they need to be rescued. And this is a, a Woma python that somebody had hit with a whippersnipper. Um, so they were just cleaning up and saw the snake, so they attacked the snake with a whippersnipper. Um, so not a, a nasty injury, but it wasn't too bad. Um, we anaesthetised him, cleaned it all up, sutured it together, and he was released. So one of the things that a lot of people don't appreciate when we're working with wildlife is that we have a, a very simple rule. If we can't fix this thing so that it can be released, then we euthanise it. Okay? And people say, oh, can't you get it into a breeding program? I'm aware of two breeding programs in Australia, and both are for species that we don't hold in Queensland. So, you know, we can't just put these guys into a zoo or into a, a breeding program. They just don't exist. So animals that come in with open fractures and so forth, um, we will generally euthanise them. And in fact, if you, there is a reason they've come into care, and it's because they're too sick to get away. Um, and if we're, we're working on, if we would euthanise 80 to 90% of the animals that come in, but only after we've evaluated them to be 100% sure that we can't treat them. So, modern technology. I graduated back in 1982. So I tell the students way back last century when the world was still flat before you were born, when Centurion was a rank, not a tank. And they have no idea what that means. So, times have changed. And I laugh when Joel said about Twitter, because that's the noise my patients make, they Twitter. I have no idea how to do Twitter. Now, I have kids, they can do that. Okay, but how is modern technology, what parts of modern technology have changed the way that I treat animals? And I think basically it comes down to these three things, communications, diagnostics, and our ability to treat. I think these are the things that have really changed the way we do things. So with communications, the internet. Um, I can still remember a friend of mine saying, you've got to get onto this thing called a computer. You know, and you can get these things called CD-ROMs, and they're really, you can play games and do all sorts of things. And then a couple of years later, he said, there's this thing called the internet. You really need to be a part of it. And so we got into the internet, and now I converse um, all around the world with colleagues about different cases. We had a wedge-tailed eagle last year that somebody had tried to tame by cutting the talons off its toes. So I emailed Pat Reddick over at the um, Minnesota Raptor Rehabilitation Centre and asked him, what do you do with these? You know, you are the foremost guru in the world on treating raptors. And I got many emails back from him with treatment suggestions, ideas and prognosis. And we can now say that Eva fully recovered um, but wasn't fit to be released. So technically we should have euthanised her. But after three months of treating her, that wasn't going to happen. And so we did get her into a zoo and she's now part of a free flight exhibit. Um, and she's doing very well and teaching people by showing her mangled feet um, the dangers of people trying to keep wildlife as pets. But she's do doing extremely well. But without this sort of a setup, you know, to be able to talk around the world with colleagues, and it's not just around the world, I can email Jane McGee and Erica Mata, our next speakers, and I can talk to them about how would you treat this? And just the other day I had a peacock in with a shattered leg and um, Jane talked me through the best ways to repair it, which we did, and the bird's now walking on that leg and I've got to take the pins out in a couple of months. You still haven't looked at the post-op rads for me. You said you would. <laughs> so communication has really opened up to a whole breadth of knowledge and experience. And it's really, it goes way beyond journals and um, online texts and all this sort of stuff. We get a tremendous amount of information from our colleagues. We have the ability to do really fancy diagnostics. Um, this is a wombat getting a CT. So these are, this is an older photo, but um, this is a CT that we did just last week. Now this wombat was presented, it's a zoo animal, and he was presented because he was a bit off his food and he was bleeding occasionally from the mouth. 
And the referring vet had anaesthetised him and examined his mouth and he couldn't find anything. So we did a CT. So the CT showed us this massive tooth root abscess. You know, it's huge. That black shadow in there is all pus sitting there. That's the good tooth. So he's got this massive big abscess there. And because this is modern technology, I have a veterinary dentist coming in tomorrow who's going to take that tooth out, drain the abscess, and keep going with injections of penicillin, which is what I started him on last week. Um, without a CT, we would never have found that abscess. And that's just one example of the sort of advanced diagnostics that we can use now, diagnosing everything in birds, reptiles, and small mammals. We can do ultrasound, we can do um, cardiology, we can do a whole range of different techniques. I love CTs, but that's because you know, they can make a 3D dimensional model and I just like toys. Diagnostics, that's a big wombat. No, it's not, it's a koala. You know, this is a guy who came in the other day. That's Beck, my nurse. Um, we're now we're developing a protocol for assessing these guys when they come in, um, working with Claude Lacasse, as I said. And so we anaesthetise when they come in and we take multiple x-rays. The belly's all clipped so that we can do an ultrasound. Um, those are his testicles, and that is a pulse oximeter clip because he hasn't got little fingers that I can measure his blood oxygen on. And Beck's placing an IV catheter. And he's intubated, he's got a capnograph here so we can measure his expired carbon dioxide so we can make sure he's ventilating well. And this guy, despite he had reasonably severe injuries, he's got a pulmonary contusion, so bleeding into the right side of his lung. But we've passed him on now to Claude and she's taking the, the treatment that we started and is just continuing on doing what we started. So treatment has really changed the way that we can do things. Technology has changed our treatments. We can do surgeries. We can opt not to do surgeries because we know that the patient may not benefit from it. So we don't just do these things for the sake of doing it. We do blood transfusions. We do, we've transfused turtles, joeys, birds, snakes, um, bearded dragons. We'll tra you know, if it's got blood, we'll give it a transfusion. I have read a paper describing blood transfusions in tarantulas, but I haven't had anybody bring me in a tarantula so I can try. So we do a whole range of different things. But at the end of the day, we still get to play with puggles, a little baby echidna. So I think I win the cute prize for the night. I'm sure I do. But we see these guys occasionally coming in, and they are as cute as they look. Um, so that's how technology has changed the way that we treat wildlife medicine. We still have very harsh rules about who lives and who dies, but it's based on our chances of getting them back into the wild. And with modern technology, the ability to communicate with our colleagues, to discuss cases, the ability to do better diagnostics and to treat better, we're increasing the number of animals that we're releasing and not just euthanising them all as they come in through the door. So wildlife medicine has gained immensely because of modern technology. And I promise that one day I will learn what Twitter is. I reserve the right to decide whether or not I will use it. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. All right, our second speaker tonight is Dr. Erica Mello, who is a senior lecturer and veterinary specialist in internal medicine at UQ Vets Small Animal Hospital again. She has a particular interest in minimally invasive techniques, particularly the use of laser technology in animals such as dogs and cats. Please welcome Eric. Thank you for this introduction, and I'll get the computer started. Hopefully with that, not too much trouble. Password, please. <laughs> Don't have text, Facebook problem. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. So I will take you on a fast track journey through um, minimally invasive techniques in dogs. And we will be talking a lot about new technologies, how great our referral hospitals are, how well-trained our veterinarians and specialists are, but if you think about it, would have everything happened if we didn't have had a change in the status of our animals nowadays? So pets are full members of our families, and 
In that regard, they deserve the same type of care. So now, can you guess on which pictures the veterinarians are hiding? Hard to know, right? Same type of gears, a lot of um, the very sophisticated equipment, um, same focus and um, untroubled attention to the patient. In that situation, the veterinarians are there and the physician on the other side. I was lucky enough through my training um, in the States to um, work at the Animal Medical Center and work with Dr. Alison Berndt and Dr. Chick Wise. Both of them have been pioneered um, in the development of minimally invasive techniques in dogs and cats. So now, can you guess which one of those is the OR? And remember, they are located in New York. Hard to know, right? So this is the one on the left. Um, obviously, not all referral hospitals are so well suited and equipped, but that's definitely where um, veteran, medicine is, veteran medicine is heading. So what is exactly minimally invasive techniques, what does that mean? Pretty much it's a procedure that can be done through a minimal incision or a procedure that can be done through a natural orifice. The advantage of those procedures is to minimize the discomfort to the patient, to reduce morbidity, mortality, um, to reduce hospitalization time and cost as well. But even of more advantage of those techniques is that those allow to treat some animal that couldn't be treated with surgery in the past. So to move along, I just want to present to you what an involved to do minimally invasive techniques. So obviously you need training to do those, but you also need some um, quite advanced gear to do that. So from left to right, you find the C-arm, which is a fluoroscopy unit that allows you to acquire live radiograph and follow through what's happening in the patient. Endoscopy tower and scopes, and as you see, a wide variety of different scope, different lengths, different diameter to be able to um, scope any size of patient. And Although C-arm and endoscopy tower can be found in most of the referral hospital, laser units are quite uncommon nowadays in veteran medicine. Um, only a few universities and practices have it in the States, and UQ is looking at acquiring um, actually a laser unit soon, and hopefully in the next couple of months, um, which will allow us to be the first university in Australia to be able to offer those, this technique. So now you're going to ask, well, um, what, what type of case do you treat with those minimally invasive techniques? So we'll go over four cases. Um, and here is the first one. Obviously, you know what's going to happen. Um, dog will take that piece of meat, uh, run away, chew it up um, in many pieces, probably swallow a couple of those pieces. And next thing you know, you add the vet, and this is what you see. One piece is stuck in the esophagus. So going surgically in that area in the chest will be quite difficult and bring a fair number of complications. So what about going down the natural passages, so down the throat, um, down into the esophagus, and try to grab it from the inside? So no incision required. So I'll show you here um, an endoscopy of um, the esophagus of the dog. So you go in with a scope, and what you see, um, that little white line that is moving, is an actual basket that you're going to try to wrap around the front body. Um, it can be quite tricky sometimes. Um, this procedure can be a very quick or a very long procedure. Um, and then you grab it, and then once you have a good handle on that, then you can just remove it and, um, and take it out through the mouth. Second application is not only you can remove foreign body, but potentially you can insert foreign body. And you're going to be like, inserting foreign body. Well, what we call foreign body in medical science is more implants. So what you see on that right side here is what we call a stent. 
And you can put stents pretty much um, in any all organ um, in the body. Here's an example of using those stents in the respiratory tract. So you'll find here a normal trachea seen from the inside on the top with endoscopy and here from the radiograph. What you see is that the trachea is widely open and you can see here the trachea widely open. If you compare it to that slide, um, that center part of the slide, you can see that there's a protrusion of what we call the dorsal membrane. It's obstructing the passage of air, and you can even see it on that radiograph. The lumen of that trachea is obstructed. In those cases, the dogs are coughing, um, they have difficulty breathing, and even though a lot of cases can be handled with drug and by giving medication, the most severe ca case need to be addressed by relieving the obstruction. And the way you do that is by putting a stent in. You can put those stent in by either endoscopy guidance, so using the scope going down into the trachea and deploying the stent, or by doing fluoroscopy and looking at the stent that are, as you can see, radio-opaque, so you can see them on the radiograph and deploy it that way. Another application of putting stents in a patient is in the urinary tract, and the urinary tract is one of my um, area of interest. So the reason why you might have to put a stent in, um, in the urinary tract is when you have an obstruction somewhere. So just as a little reminder of the urinary tract in both humans and, and dogs, it's quite similar. You have both kidneys, the ureters connecting the kidneys to the bladder, the urinary tract connecting the bladder um, to the outside. In older dogs, especially older females, what can happen is that they can have a tumor growing into the urethra, or even sometimes as well in the neck of the bladder, which is called the trigone. When the tumor gets too big, it can really obstruct the passage of urine, and you can really get obstructed not being able to void. So if that's a cancer, obviously you can do surgery, you can do radiation therapy, you can do chemo, that's all sort of thing that we can do in dogs as well as humans. But chemo and all those things won't especially chemo, won't be fast enough to shrink that tumor. So you need to really address it by a mechanical way. And the mechanical way to relieve that obstruction is to put a stent in. So what does a stent do is that it's going to push away all this abnormal tissue and rest of the passages. So now I have a video to show you, which I hope will work fine. Here we go. So that's pretty much the way it is done. Um, so you have to identify first the area that is obstructed. So the way you do it is that you inject some contrast into the urinary tract. So urinary bladder is here, the urethra, and this is a male dog, is here. And you see that the contrast is kind of going okay in that region, but... Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm just talking for myself here. Um, let me, thanks for letting me know. So maybe, let me grab it from different, that will be here soon. Bear with me. Maybe I'll just load it from here. Not coming. Sorry, you won't have the picture, the pretty picture. Sorry. So pretty much the way we do it is that you put contrast into the urinary tract and you highlight where the lesion is so that you know exactly what size of stent you need to put it and you take all your measurement from that study, that contrast study. Um, after that, you put the stent um, using fluoroscopy, so you deploy the stent using that technology to place it in the right uh, position. Hmm. There we go. Next use of minimally invasive techniques in the urinary tract is the use of medical laser. And this part is quite fun because you can see on that 
part of the screen, yeah, you can see it, um, that there are some mineral opacity in the bladder of that dog. Um, those are stones, and if in the past you had to go to surgery to get them removed, um, nowadays what you can do is that you can destroy them by using a laser fiber that you insert into the working channel of an endoscope. So I'll play it again because I know it's fun, and it's fun to do as well, but I'm sure you're enjoying that as well. So you just break it down into small pieces that in the end you can grab with a basket and you can grab it out, um, out of the urinary tract without any incision on that dog. And the last use in the last case is, again with a laser, you can treat some congenital conditions. So as I have reminded you of the anatomy of the urinary tract, it is a bladder. And here is the um, ureter entering the bladder in a normal location. In, con in some congenital disease, what can happen is that the ureter travel inside the wall of the bladder and actually open into the urethra, leading to urinary incontinence. So in the past, what they would do is that surgically, they would resect that piece and then they would reimplant it into the bladder. That was... An a successful outcome that could still lead to some complication around the time of surgery. Nowadays, what we can offer is to destroy that abnormal band of tissue and put back the opening of the ureter in a more normal location. Here's a video again of lasering that abnormal tissue. So as you can see, it's not bleeding that much because it cauterizes at the same time. Um, it's a work of patience, so you have to go slowly and making sure that you're not damaging all the tissues around. Um, but it's pretty much the way we do it. And very gently, you follow the catheter that is inserted in the uh, ureter and um, up till the point where you're happy with the new location of the ureteral opening. So it's an accelerated um, procedure where you can see um, how nicely open the ureteral opening is at the end. So 10 minutes is quite short to go through all those procedures, but um, I know we focus a lot on things that have been changing um, and in a positive way, but I think there are still a lot of things that we need to keep the way they are, and some of those are working with a great team, and this is um, my team, internal medicine team at Gatton. Um, the other thing is, yeah, it's nice to have very new gears, but I still work with that stethoscope, good and well-traveled, that is an instrument that, when you think about it, hasn't really changed for maybe a century, so all this is still good. And um, the last thing is, still work with patient, which I know I share with a lot of my colleagues working in the field. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions, and feel free to <laughs> communicate with me if you have any comments. Okay, our next speaker is Dr. D. Whitworth who, as a vet researcher and a lecturer, has become especially interested in the emerging field of stem cells, including what they can and cannot be used for. Um, she's particularly interested in a range of areas, including regenerative medicine, reproduction, species conservation, and mammalian evolution. So could you please welcome Dr. D. Whitworth. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm sorry I don't have puggles and I don't get to blast bladder stones to oblivion, um, but I do have stem cells and these are exciting to me and I hope by the end of this evening you'll think they're pretty jolly cool as well. So when we talk about stem cells, the first thing we need to do actually is define what we mean by a stem cell. So stem cells generally can be divided into two main groups being embryonic and adult. And when we talk about embryonic stem cells, as their name suggests, these are derived from um, an embryo, but particularly from a little puddle 
of cells called the inner cell mass. So if you have a look at this diagram up here, this is a blastocyst. So this is when an egg's been fertilised, it's continued to divide for several days. And then this little collection of cells here is the inner cell mass. And these are the cells that are destined to become the embryo. So a unique feature of these cells is that they're pluripotent, which means they can form any type of cell in an animal, and so they've attracted a lot of interest in terms of being used for regenerative medicine. If they can form any type of cell, maybe you can use them to repair cells that you need fixed or replaced. But we have problems in using um, these embryonic stem cells in that if we're talking about human stem cells, of course they need to be harvested from human embryos. This carries with it a whole lot of ethical concerns, but if we're talking about domestic animals, trying to get these blastocysts from cats or dogs or horses or cattle and then isolating these cells and maintaining them in an in vitro environment is technically really difficult. Another thing about these cells is to do with their pluripotent state. So pluripotency is a double-edged sword. Even though it has lots of potential for regenerative medicine, the flip side is that because these cells are pluripotent, they readily form tumours. So if you're transplanting these cells into an injured knee, what you don't want is a great big tumour developing in your knee, and that's what these cells can do. So research is focused more on adult stem cells, and adult stem cells actually are found in the majority of our tissues where they play an important role in the maintenance of those tissues and repair. So if you go to the gym and you exercise a lot and you come out the next day and your muscles are really sore, it's your adult stem cells, or specifically these mesenchymal stem cells that are living within your muscle cells that help repair the damage that you've done. So mesenchymal stem cells, although they're present in lots of different tissues in the body, are found in pretty high concentrations within adipose tissue, or fat, tissue, which more and more of us have more and more of, um, and also the bone marrow. So another feature about these that makes them appealing is rather than being pluripotent, they're described as being multipotent. So they don't have quite the same potential to form lots of different tissues as our embryonic stem cells do. They have a more restricted differentiation profile. So you can see we've got our MSCs here. They can form heart tissue, bone tissue, cartilage, epithelium of the cornea, liver, muscle, nerve tissue, and fat, not much of a market for that. But all of these other sorts of cell types can be generated from MSCs. Because they're multipotent rather than pluripotent, they don't form tumours. So they don't have a lot of the same risks associated with them that our embryonic stem cells have. And they grow very happily in culture. So looking at mesenchymal stem cells, they're relatively easy to harvest. So you can collect them from fat, bone marrow, also from umbilical cord blood. And they have the ability to form important tissues in terms of regenerative medicine, so cartilage, bone, and nerve cells. And so there's been a lot of interest in developing MSCs for clinical applications, especially with respect to repairing damaged cartilage in individuals with osteoarthritis, but also in tendon repair in horses. So there are commercial therapies already on offer, and they have been for quite a few years now, specifically with the aim of curing osteoarthritis, particularly in humans and dogs. So osteoarthritis, as you know, is really common in humans. It's also very common in dogs and horses. And in fact, roughly 80% of dogs above the age of eight years show some degree of osteoarthritis. So it's a degenerative disease, i.e. a wear and tear disease, and its hallmark is damage to the cartilage of the joint. And you can see that illustrated here. So it causes a lot of inflammation, which is associated with pain, decreased mobility. We can manage the pain by giving analgesics. Any of you who have got old Labradors or Golden Retrievers will probably be fairly familiar with Rimadyl, but all it does is mask the clinical signs, okay? It doesn't actually offer a cure. 
And so people have started to investigate the use of stem cells as a cure for osteoarthritis. And so they either separate the MSCs from fat that they harvest from the patient, or you can buy them commercially in a tube and then you inject them into the affected joint. So does it work? Well, yes and no, depending on your definition of work. So the first thing that is generally agreed is that the MSCs don't cure osteoarthritis, okay? I.e. they don't repair the damaged cartilage. They'll engraft or become incorporated into other tissues within the joint, but they don't seem to settle within the damaged cartilage and form new cartilage. But the positive is that they may reduce pain. So MSC secrete a potent cocktail of different chemical factors that are actually quite potent anti-inflammatories. And so they can offer pain relief, but also serve to retard the progression of the disease. But the results are variable. And part of this is because we don't actually know what dose of MSCs is most effective. We don't know how often they need to be injected. We don't know if they have to be frozen, then thawed, then expanded in culture for a while before they're injected. There are so many things we don't know. And different studies do things different ways and monitor their patients for different lengths of time. So we don't actually know the duration of effect that these cells will have. So the problem with using MSCs to cure osteoarthritis is getting the MSCs to attach to the damaged cartilage and form new cartilage, so filling in these deficits. And so one approach that we're adopting and, and other researchers around the world too is to attach the MSCs to a scaffold, a kind of support structure that helps glue the cells into the deficit but can also drive their differentiation into chondrocytes or the cells that form cartilage. But there are other roles for MSCs apart from using them to treat osteoarthritis that really we've discovered in our journey towards trying to cure osteoarthritis. And so we know that MSCs secrete potent anti-inflammatories. And so maybe they'll make a good treatment for inflammatory diseases such as atopic dermatitis, inflammatory bowel disease and chronic kidney disease in cats. And so there have been preliminary studies done across all of these diseases and the results certainly look promising um, but we need a lot more studies and these animals need to be followed for a much longer period. Another role for MSCs is perhaps to use them as delivery vehicles or maybe even stealth bombers depending on what you're wanting to do with them. So we know that they home in to sites of inflammation and they do it very aggressively and very specifically. So maybe we can use MSCs to act as carriers and deliver either gene therapy or specific molecules. And one area that's being investigated is using MSCs to deliver anti-cancer therapies. And this is certainly an emerging area of research in human medicine, but something that hasn't yet really been tapped into in the veterinary field. So here you can see we've got an MSC. It's been genetically engineered to carry what's called a suicide gene. It will hone in to the site of a tumour and then induce the tumour cells to self-destruct or apoptose. So we are using this, um, what am I trying to say, this um, propensity of MSCs to hone in to sites of inflammation in an attempt to try and treat Tasmanian devils with devil facial tumour disease. So devil facial tumour disease is a transmissible tumour, so it's an allograft that devils pass on to each other um, when they bite and squabble, when they're feeding and when they're mating, and as I'm sure you know, it's decimating the wild population of devils. So in about 20 years or so, wild devils are expected to be extinct. And so we've produced MSCs, from the Tassie Devil, and we're in the process now of genetically engineering them so that they, ex oh, let me go back, 
so that they express this protein called light. And in the mouse, um, they've shown that this light protein initiates destruction of tumour cells by triggering the immune system to attack the tumour. And so we're hoping that we can employ the same strategy in the Tassie Devil to try and destroy the tumour cells. And I just wanted to finish up with another area that I think veterinary medicine, veterinary science is going to head in the future, and that is in modelling diseases in a dish. And so this involves the use of a slightly different type of stem cell called an induced pluripotent stem cell, or IPSC. These stem cells are unique because they're created from adult cells. So basically you could take skin cells from any individual, anybody in this room, you then put genes into them that trick the cells into reverting back to a pluripotent state. And so you can make stem cells from an individual with a specific disease. So if you can make iPSCs from an individual with a disease and then differentiate those cells into a specific cell type, you can then model that disease within a dish with all the genetic mutations or other aberrations within those cells that have conferred that disease on the individual in the first place. You can then use these cells to develop and test different drugs. And so this is certainly an area that's getting a lot of attention and a lot of funding in human medicine, but it's yet to really enter the veterinary sphere. So we're tapping into this in a very minor way um, in the horse in that we've produced horse induced pluripotent stem cells and we've turned them into neurons or nerve cells, and we're interested in how West Nile virus affects these neurons. And so we wanted to know if our iPSC-derived neurons were affected by West Nile virus in the same way as horse neurons within a horse, and the answer is yes, they are. And so now we can study how the virus enters those neurons, what it does to cause them to die, and then eventually, other people might be able to use this data to develop a vaccine or a treatment for West Nile virus in horses. And then we can also expand this technology to look at the behaviour of other viruses, such as Hendra. So to summarise the state of play of stem cells in veterinary medicine, I think it's fair to say that stem cells still can't cure osteoarthritis, but they may bring about pain relief and retard the progression of the disease. MSCs, I think, are going to become an important adjunct therapy as anti-inflammatories. And they also hold a lot of potential as delivery vehicles, particularly in the treatment of cancer. But I think also the modelling of disease in a dish is an area that the veterinary field will move into in the future. And so, all up, Yes, I think stem cells show a lot of promise, great promise, but it's very early days. Thank you. Thanks, Dee. Amazing stuff. All right, and last but by no means least, please welcome Dr. Jane McGee, who is a senior lecturer in small animal surgery, also at UQ School of Vet Science, working in the referral surgical service um, she's been involved in using 3D printing and, again, minimally invasive surgery, most notably in an adorable dog named Ziggy with three legs. Um, but more to come. Please welcome Dr. Jane McGee. So you'll have to excuse me for a minute. I have to boot up the computer, the wonders of technology. Okay, so I'd like to say... Thank you to everybody for coming out tonight to listen to us. Um, and I'd like to give you a vet surgeon's impression on what's changed in the last 80 years. Um, and I thought about asking Bob, but he can't really help me quite back for 80 years. Um, so what I thought was I'd start, I thought, well, what's going to have changed? Well, maybe the students have changed. So in this picture here, um, this is the 1938 graduating class from the University of Queensland from the vet school. 
And what you'll see here is the first um, female graduate, Mer Mary McPherson. And so then I thought, OK, let's compare that to who we have today. So this is the 2015 graduating class. And so I thought, well, what's the big obvious is that we have more women graduating from veterinary medicine today, with nearly 90% of the graduates around the world being women. But other than that, if you take away all the different hairstyles and fancy shoes, the students are still the same as they were many years ago, still out to treat the animals. So then I thought, let's look at the equipment. So I went, the first thing I, th I thought of when I saw this was, that, thank goodness I don't have to work with that table. So that's the 1950 version of a surgeon's operating table versus today's unit where we have, this is not our theatre, this is um, in the University of Pennsylvania and it's their minimally invasive theatre. But most of the theatres are the same, great lighting, adjustable tables, um, digital cam cameras within the lights. And so then I thought, OK, let's look at something else. So this is the fuel kit from uh, veterinarians back in the 50s. And I looked at that and thought, well, actually, the fundamental instruments are the same, a bit like Erica's stethoscope, still the same. Scissors are scissors and forceps are forceps. But what has changed when we look at what we have today is we have a more extensive range of equipment, plus we have specialised equipment for advanced procedures. So especially orthopaedic and spinal um, equipment and, and minimally invasive equipment. So that made me think, well, what really have been the major influences on all of this development? And I think that there are two main driving forces. The first one, I think, is the human-animal bond. I think it's, th it's this and the fact that the pets today, for the majority, are members of our family. Uh, we love them very much, we value them as members of our family. They enhance our lives, they give us joy in so many ways and they give us hope in many ways. The other big thing is the service animals that, the service animals that we have and that's our military dogs, our police dogs, our working dogs on the farm and not to forget our service dogs in the community doing a great job with people in need. The other part that I thought was very, that's the other f driving force, I think, is the growth in technology, as we've all talked about. So over the last 30 years, there's been a technology explosion. And so much of what we consider normal today has only come about in the last 20 years or 20 to 30 years. And with these advancements have come great advancements in medical and veterinary technology. So in the veterinary profession, technology has led us to improved surgical implants and equipment. And this in turn has allowed us to perform improved surgical techniques. It's allowed us to focus on preventative surgery, reconstructive surgery and replacement surgery. And all of these things bring about an improved quality of life for our pets. So when I talk about advancing advanced technologies, what am I talking about? So total hip replacements, total elbows, total stifles. This is a dog with um, hip dysplasia that's had a total hip replacement. Plus, we, learn, we've, we know a lot more about things like elbow disease and stifle disease, two of the big orthopaedic problems affecting our dogs out there today. We do minimally invasive surgery. We do some more spinal surgery. We have implants, limb prostheses, plus we have another uh, wider range of advanced techniques and technologies that we utilise today now in everyday surgery. And there's two that I'd like to talk about. First is minimally invasive surgery, following on a little bit from what Erica was talking about. Now, I'm sorry if this picture is a little bit gruesome. I was actually made to change out the one that I had in there today because it was way too gruesome, apparently. I, I thought it was great. <laughs> anyway, so when we traditionally think about surgery, this is what we think about an open surgical approach. So looking um, at a dog, say, with liver cancer or something else, the only way to access the liver to have a look at it and to get diagnostic samples was to actually open the dog up and reach in and feel the liver and take a piece of it. Today, however, we go to minimally invasive surgery where we use scope, laparoscopes and um, advanced technology and actually do stuff while we're with our hands, while we're watching a camera and everything's going on inside the patient, but we actually haven't got the patient open. But we can achieve the same results. So what does this mean? So we have cameras on, on scopes. 
We insert them via small incisions into um, a body cavity, normally the um, abdomen or the thorax, but sometimes into a joint as well. Um, and we're allowed, we can see the internal organs, we can take samples of the internal organs and we can perform surgical techniques. So this is, a, a, in this image here, we're actually taking a liver, liver biopsy. So you can see how up close and personal we've got with that liver and the gallbladder, but we're not actually inside the animal. The other things that we can do is perform surgical techniques. This is a, a gastropexy where we've actually sutured the stomach onto the abdominal wall. And we do this as a preventative surgery to help prevent gastric dilation and, and torsion in our large breed dogs, which is a, a, a life-threatening disease um, that we can hopefully prevent by doing a simple surgery. In this view, we're doing an arthroscopic procedure. So this dog has elbow dysplasia, and you can see that there's a small piece of bone here and you don't think it's small, but this whole portal is only 1.9 millimetres in diameter. And that little probe there is less than a millimetre in diameter. So you get an amazing look. And we can, we can remove that fragment of bone and that dog can go home virtually the same day. So what are the advantages? So the advantages are, like Erica said, we get improved visualisation, we get nice deep access into those, into those um, organs, but we get improved recovery. We do less trauma to the animal, we make small incisions, less trauma, cause them less pain and inflammation, which means that they have a shorter hospital stay and they go home a lot, quite, a lot faster to their families. The other um, technique I just quickly want to talk about is 3D modelling and how this is changing our way forward in surgery. So what I mean by that is we are now able to take images that we, take, that we collect via CT scans. We can format them into a file format that can be sent through a computer and print it out into a, three, into a 3D image of what we've been looking at, so a bone. And in this view here, you'll see that these guys are looking at a skull, and that skull is actually a tumour in that um, zygomatic arch there. And they're, dis they're, they're looking at it, they're, they're turning it over, and they're planning their surgery to make sure that they get the best outcome. And so this technology not only helps us plan our surgery, but for me as a teacher, it helps me explain it to the students and it helps me explain it to owners, which I think is an amazing way forward. So what I wanted to do to give you an example is to talk about Ziggy. And unfortunately, Ziggy was meant to be with us tonight, but his owners, his mum and dad have other um, commitments. So this is Ziggy's story. So I met, so Ziggy was adopted by his parents when he was 12 weeks old. And at that time, he had already suffered a terrible injury to his right elbow and he had to have his right forelimb forelim amputated. So you can see that Ziggy's only got one front leg, but he's still awful cute. So when I met him, he was actually six months old. And what you can see is that he was having trouble walking. And if you look at his front leg, it's bent underneath him. And no matter how much I called him, he didn't want to walk. So I took some x-rays and what we found is, is that the growth plate of that front leg had, was deformed and, the, and that front leg was bending and it was growing in a bend. And because he was too little to do a definitive corrective surgery on, what I did was take a little bit of bone out of the, this, the second bone in that front leg and that allows this bone to grow as straight as we could get it. We already knew it was bent but it allows it to grow as straight as we can. And we popped him in a bandage for the next couple of months to try and keep his legs straight while his fracture healed. And then we knew that we would be planning a definitive surgery later on. So this is Ziggy and you can see his little front leg is, not, is bent. And mum and dad bought him, his mum and dad bought him a cart um, so that he could still run and play and exercise but he didn't weight bear too much on that bent leg. And they also used it to train him because I knew when I did surgery with him that he would need something to support him while he was healing because he couldn't bounce up and down on his, on his leg. So when he was fully grown, he came in and we did some images. So I took a CT scan of his leg and that was all very well and good but I'm not... I'm not like the male surgeons that are in the room. I can't see something and work out what's going on. So we then put it into a 3D image on the computer, but it's still on a computer. I can't pick it up and feel it and decide what's going on. I can see that it's bent. I just couldn't work it out. So 
With the help of the people from Griffith University, they printed off his Ziggy's leg for me. And that allowed me to plan the surgery so I could physically pick the leg up and hold it. I could work out what implants I was going to use, where I was going to cut the limb before I did the surgery. Because for Ziggy, it was really important. He only had one front leg and if I messed it up, he was in trouble. So he came in and we did some surgery. And we cut his bone, straightened his leg up, put this gizmo on it called an external fixateur, a hybrid external fixateur, which looks really complicated, but it's actually only a couple of little wires going through the leg. And then he recovered in hospital and um, he used his cart to get around the hospital to go outside to toilet, to come up and down and say hi to everybody. Um, I know it was Christmas time because he's got a Christmas bandage on, so it was 12 months ago. So this is Ziggy today. His leg's lovely and straight. He runs around on three legs. He only uses his cart when he goes on big kilometre runs with his dad. They gave me a heart attack the other day because they sent me a picture that they thought that I would like and I was like, oh my golly, here he is <laughs> jumping for a ball. And Ziggy thinks he's normal. He doesn't think there's anything wrong with him. So where do I think we're going in the future with 3D printing? Well, what I know is that there's already implants out there that are being printed in titanium for us to use in surgery now. We also know that there's dogs like Derby, and if you want to go online, you can follow Derby online. He was born with a congenital deformity, and he's had 3D prosthetic limbs made for him so that he can run around and play with his family. This is a human, uh, a printed human implant for a hip, and they've impregnated it with stem cells. And this is a total elbow that was, um, that was printed out of titanium for a dog that needed an elbow replacement. So this is the future for us. And all I can say is that I think we're only limited by our imagination for what we can do into the future. So I'm very excited that I'm, I have the opportunity to be involved with this and I have the opportunity to improve the lives of our pets. And I think it will just get better and better heading into the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. And we'd now like to invite, uh, now that you've just sat down, invite you all back up onto the stage and we're going to have a brief Q&A session. So if you have questions that you would like to ask of our panel um, on anything you've seen tonight or more, please write them down, wave them in the air, and Leonie and I will come around and collect those in just a moment. Uh, in the meantime, um, letting you know next month will be our last Briz Science Talk for the year and we have a wonderful guests. Um, we have the uh, Executive Director of the LIGO Laboratory at the California Institute of Technology who was part of the team that discovered gravitational waves. So you might have seen that story, uh, amazing discovery and he's going to be in Brisbane to talk about that. So check out the website, check all the details the will be there. Um, while you're online, also encourage you to check out the other things that are on at the edge, including their fantastic 3D printing laboratory downstairs that you can go and use and print your pet's own 3D leg. Um, maybe make some of those <laughs> blades to let them run even faster, uh, you know, all sorts of options for you there. So um, hop online and check that out. Um, Okay, so while we're collecting the rest of those questions, we have a few on Twitter. Um, I'm just going to find the first one from uh, Linda Tate. So Linda asks, um, now, sort of a nice easy questions to get things started, but um, do restrictions on human testing lead human doctors to study vet medicine as a path for research? There are a lot of restrictions on animal testing. Yeah. Um, animal ethics committees um, are run by every university um, and several government departments to ensure that the minimal amount of harm is done to animals and it has to be well and truly justified. So although um, it's tempting to say that animal experimentation um, takes the place of human experimentation, um, the controls and restrictions on it are there to safeguard the welfare of animals. And all of us have at some stage put in an Animal Ethics Committee application and just know how rigorous the screening is to make sure that we're not actually causing unnecessary harm. Does that help? 
Yeah, well, that was a bit <laughs> me. Um, so a question for Erica. Um, how does the expense of, uh, and I mean, this is probably for everyone as well, but how does the expense of treatments on animals compare to that of humans? Um, so I guess sort of along the lines of, you know, there's a lot of similarities, but is it, you know, more specialised equipment or can you be, uh, is it easier in some ways on animals? Um, I guess it's comparable. The only difference is that for animals you have to pay of your own pocket, whereas for a human being, um, the society contribute to your treatment. So you won't necessarily see how much that entails um, on a real bill, so you'll just see part of that bill. So um, unfortunately, I'm not sure how much um, a bill would be for a human being. Um, um, for a dog or a cat going through those type of procedure, you have to count on probably a, t a couple of thousand to get those procedures done, yeah. Mm. I think that um, I don't know that. I think that um, one of the um, things that I can give an example for is something like a total hip replacement that may cost um, sort of eight thousand dollars or something like that in a dog, which seems very high. But a lot of people, a lot of times now, it's covered by pet insurance, which we are very thankful that a lot of people are very responsible getting pet insurance. But in a person, that total hip replacement is going to cost seventy, eighty, a hundred thousand dollars. So, um, and the implants are not that dissimilar and the medications and the drugs that we use aren't that dissimilar. Um, you just don't see that cost because it's, it's, it's hidden in a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the stuff that you see. So in comparison, you know, sometimes it's, it's what seems like a lot for veterinary surgery is actually a small in relation to what would be in people for pretty much similar, a similar job. Um, and just got a follow-up question or related question, um, which is what is the current situation of the communication between doctors and vets um, and would m more communication be of use to both? So this, this is the, um, con the concept of One Health. Um, that there is a One Health approach to both animals and to people. And it's improving. Um, the doctors are starting to listen. <laughs> My father was a doctor, so I can say that and get away with it. <laughs> Um, I think both sides are coming to the party and agreeing on things like, for example, antimicrobial resistance. Um, the Australian Veterinary Association has developing guidelines towards the responsible use of antimicrobials um, in both companion animal and livestock practice to try and minimise the evolution of these uh, multi-drug resistant bacteria. That's just one example of how doctors and vets are starting to work together. Um, we have discussions with our medical colleagues about zoonotic diseases, diseases that are transmitted from animals to people. Um, we are still regarded by some medical professionals as the poor country cousins, um, but they are, they're constantly surprised at the things that we can do. Yeah. Um, question for D. Um, how much of the stem cell research on animals um, could then cross over to humans? So there's a lot of questions yeah. about that. Um, yeah, a lot of it. Um, and I guess, to just within the research field, something that scientists are starting to really appreciate is that large animals, like dogs, horses, cattle, actually make better models for human diseases than rats and mice. And I think this is a good thing for us because to do this kind of research with stem cells costs a lot of money, a heck of a lot of money. So if you can turn things around to say, well, by studying osteoarthritis in the dog, it's not just going to help Fluffy, but ultimately it's going to help humans, it, it's easier to get funding to do that. And, you know, the dynamics of a dog's hip joint are very similar to that of a human joint. Mm. So it is very translatable. Um, a question from Twitter, probably for Bob, um, not to bring it down a little bit, but uh, Linda mentions um, a high euthanasia rate that you mm. mentioned. Um, does the school use these as learning opportunities for vet students? Uh, every, every animal that comes into the clinic um, is seen and touched at some stage by a student. Um, the only exception is during exam time when they don't want anything to do with us. <laughs> They're all out hiding somewhere, I'm not sure where. Um, so every animal that um, is examined, is treated, is, is examined and treated with student involvement. Um, there are obviously sometimes when we minimise that, if there's a danger to the student, if there is a danger to the animal. 
Some of these students are quite dangerous. We mould them over the 12 months that we have them at the end of their course and make them safe. Um, but when they start, they can be quite dangerous. Um, and I believe I was the same, but I don't recall that. That's so long ago. Um, so yes, even the euthanasia of animals. Um, you know, as my, my rules for euthanasia are simple, that the animal must not be aware that it is happening and it must experience no pain and no fear or suffering. So we anaesthetise them first. So the students have the opportunity to anaesthetise an animal. Um, once they have anaesthetised the animal, we'll give them an intravenous injection of a lethal drug. So the students, again, will have the opportunity to practise um, the giving of an intravenous injection into a bird or a reptile or a small mammal. So they will have those opportunities. Um, I do need to emphasise, though, this is when we're talking about wildlife, um, when we're talking about owned pets, um, that comes back to the clinician um, and most of those cases are actually done by the clinicians involved, not really by a student. And most, and most of those dogs, uh, most of those wildlife and stuff will go on and get a post-mortem too and, and, yeah, and the students correct. will also learn from them. Um, they'll learn their anatomy and, and they'll learn post-mortem techniques. So the animals aren't, um, although they're euthanised for whatever their disease is, they they're, have a great benefit to our students for learning. All right, um, a couple of hopefully quicker questions, slightly more upbeat questions to finish. Um, Arwen, who I think is 12, asks, why do so many vets know very little about chickens and do you think that will change? <laughs> <laughs> I guess that one's for me. <laughs> um, because when, when I was a student, we were only taught about commercial poultry. Chicken sick, kill chicken, find out why it's sick, treat the rest. That was the basic approach to chicken medicine, to poultry medicine. It was a flock or a herd health approach. Now, we know um, that the, the backyard chicken is making a huge resurgence um, to the extent where it is the third most common bird presented to veterinary clinics um, after budgies and cockatiels. So we do see a lot of chickens. We are learning a lot about them. We've gone back away from herd health. You know, this is somebody's pet. I can't just kill it and just find out what's going on. Um, so I, um, I do practise the same level of medicine um, that I practise for macaws and emus and ostriches and things like that. So we're getting there. We are getting there, but it's, um, it's a long road back. Great. And the last question, I don't know who wrote it, but I love it. Um, for all of you, what made you want to do this job? <laughs> in, in your own time, there may be pro professors, there will be promotions in the audience, I can neither confirm nor deny. Um. Well, I think I'll start off. Because yeah, you the veterinary profession is an incredibly hard, gruelling job. Um, I typically will work in the clinic 60 hours a week at a minimum. Um, on a per hour rate, um, my daughter gets more, um, and she's a police officer. So it's uh, financially, you're not there for the money. Mm. Um, I have been a clinician for 34 years. My goal every year is to be better than I was the year before. Working with people like these gives me that opportunity because I learn so much from them. They don't think I am, but I'm listening to everything they say. Um, I just don't do what they tell me to do. I just listen. <laughs> um, it's, an, it's an incredibly rewarding career. You do something new every day. There's nothing assembly line about it. Um, you have to think, you have to discover, you have to research. It's um, an incredible job to be involved in. You're just not going to get rich. <laughs> I guess for me, this is the opportunity to work in a hospital that has the potential to grow um, and develop into new techniques, being able to teach students in their final years and seeing them grow and be part of their development, professional development. And then, and the last part is being able to have time to do research, um, obviously. For me, I guess very much a dual love of animals and a passion for discovery. And I think that's the thing about being a vet. You are a veterinary scientist. So not only are you a clinician, but you're trained in scientific method and how to be a scientist. And so being able to do both of those, um, it just I can't be anything else. It's me. Yeah, and I agree with Dee. I, I grew up on a farm and I love animals of all different sizes and shapes. Um, 
but it's that it's that thirst for knowledge that you have and for advancement. And for me, it's what makes me go to work every day is the fact that I can help not only the, the animals, but I can help their families that are suffering along with their animals and that I can teach the students and try and make our new um, crop of veterinarians the best veterinarians they can be so they can go out and help your animals to the best of their ability. So that keeps me going back to work every day. Yeah, that's fantastic, inspiring stuff. Oh, and answer, to answer your original question, Bob, yes, I do think you won the cuteness competition tonight, um, and your animals were adorable as well. Um, ladies and gentlemen, could you please join me in thanking our fantastic panel tonight, 80 years of Vet Science at UQ, Bob, Erica, Dee and Jane. Thank you all so much. UQ has a small token of our appreciation for you, and I look forward to joining you all outside for drinks and nibblies right now. Thank you all.